the next sessions of today. So first, uh, we start with an introduction of the representative of the ATIPS networking group to set the frame. Then uh, there are presentations, so three to four presentations, uh, a 20 minute presentation, five minutes for the questions and answers, so one quick question for the audience. And then we move to a round table uh, where we have all the speakers and a representative of the, of the working group and of possibly associations. And then we debate and uh, we, uh, uh, we go further in depth in the, uh, in the specific topics uh, uh, that are presented by the, the different speakers. So once again, as I said yesterday, the idea is to get uh, feedback from you, from the national players uh, uh, commenting these national projects so as to feed uh, uh, the future roadmap, uh, the RNI roadmap of the ATIPSnet that will come out in uh, two years from now, so as to make sure that uh, we uh, specify all the RNI activities that are needed at European level, but also at national level. Then we will have session four, so session three will be moderated by myself. We'll have session four moderated by uh, Heiner, uh, you know from yesterday, so session four will be about digitalization. Session which is going to start right now is about uh, flexible uh, generation. And then after uh, the end of session four, so we'll have a wrap up. Uh, this wrap up is very important. So we have already uh, uh, prepared with Rainer, Coralie and, uh, and uh, Daniel, the main uh, conclusions from uh, yesterday. So we have written them down as statement. We will do so during the day today. And during this wrap up session, we will display uh, on the screen uh, the concluding remarks uh, uh, from this workshop. And you will have your say, you will have the possibility to amend our concluding remarks so as to make sure that when we go home tonight, we agree on the, on the main conclusions and the wording of the conclusions. Thank you. So let's start uh, uh, with the first uh, presentation. So Jesus Garcia Martin from uh, Iberdrola Renovables. Uh, and the presentation is about the scope of the ATIPSnet activities, of course. Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, I think I pick up two. Well, uh, thank you very much for your uh, interest in this uh, uh, session. Uh, our group is uh, the three and this uh, flexible generation. This is a group that was slightly complex at the beginning because when they bore, uh, was mainly uh, oriented to thermal generation or flexible thermal generation. But later, after a strong discussion inside the tip, was decided just to keep flexible generation, accepting that in general that we are looking in the future is just to have a, a system that uh, will have a generation enough to support the necessities of the demand. And then in this way, our group, uh, well, uh, it's shared by Michael Ladwig, the General Electric. Uh, I acting as co-chair together with uh, Pascal Fontaine from CMEA. And we have a, an advisor that's Vicenzo Casamassima from FCE. Uh, uh, I have not here the number, but uh, we are 30 members in this group. Uh, in, you know, there are two, two levels of, of member. One is the first years, the main people that is directly involved in the group. And there are other 40 members that are acting as tier two, mean that are people that is informed. And uh, time to time, we send when we have some kind of uh, uh, document, we circulate this document to them in order they are able to uh, in, in keep some kind of input to the, to the group. Uh, in this moment, we, are, we already have two uh, meeting face-to-face -face meeting. One first was in March, uh, that was in Milan, and a second uh, in, uh, in uh, Brussels. But next week, 6 October, we have a third meeting in Madrid, meaning that, uh, well, uh, some of the people that are in the group will come to, to the peninsula next week. Okay. Just related to the objective this that you can find directly in the, in the uh, term of reference, I pick out maybe the three main objectives and just to transmit to you the main issue. Well, we need to, to, to situate the, 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 the picture in, uh, in 2050 uh, around when we are expecting to have almost 100% of renewable. Meaning that uh, in that moment, that situation that we have is that we need to confront that uh, renewable must be able, almost the renewable that exists, must be able to conduct all the necessities of the system. But in between now and 2050, we have a transition. This is because uh, the situation was discussed inside the, this uh, ATIP. 
And it's a transition in which we need to evolve from the situation that we have right now to this situation in which all the services and necessities of the system need to be supported by the rest. Meaning that in this way, uh, we need to change in the situation from now to the 2050. One important issue is related to the thermal power conventional generation. Meaning that now the conventional power generation was designed at the beginning to offer as much as possible energy, but with very low level of flexibility looking for the technical, we can say, optimization, meaning that we are talking about that normally the power station has a very low flexibility right now and need to confront with a situation in which with the entrance of the variable energy resources, they need to evolve in order to be able to offer the necessities of the new system that is becoming. Uh, yesterday, our representation of uh, Red Electrica Española mentioned that now in Spain we are 40% average of uh, renewable energies, but we have peak of around 65 or 70%, meaning that in this moment, obviously, power generation, thermal power generation, need to cover the uncertainty that in one moment the wind is no flowing or something of the solar happening. And then this means that these uh, power stations are confronted with a complete different situation that uh, to was, to, uh, what was defined, meaning that they need to enter as soon as possible, as quick as possible, ramp up at maximum. This is absolutely contrary to the design situation that was done. And then this needs to be obviously adapted. And this is an important issue. And then he has to support a backup generation. Second issue is that in, the, in this situation of the scenario of 100% means that, uh, well, uh, there are a situation related to the function of the system, auxiliary function, uh, ancillary services, etc. Somebody needs to, to give this. Now, in the present situation, wind energy, that is the main energy that we are, for example, in Spain or whichever around uh, Europe, is not able to provide uh, no, uh, no easily. They can, but very complex because in the same manner, for example, in Spain, uh, the growing of the renewable, especially the wind, was defined as to give as much as possible energy because uh, the concept was uh, uh, the energy that I have in this moment, if I lost, I lost forever, meaning that I need to offer as much as possible energy. And this is, in fact, uh, the reimbursement that we receive for this energy is just depending on the quantity of kilowatt hour. And it has no sense in this moment. He has to decide that in one moment in one wind farm, decide to decrease the energy that is uh, injected into the network or to the grid because uh, there is a necessity because then I lost money in this moment because nobody is giving me any kind of uh, additional uh, uh, money, additional reimbursement. And then this kind of, th of thing need to be changed in order to adapt. No just to produce the energy as much as possible, it's not the energy that is needed and give, uh, for example, balancing services, ancillary services, etc. And uh, obviously uh, the, the main concept that we need to take that is I, I pinpoint downstairs in the, in, the, in the picture is just related to uh, this kind of transition in between thermal and rest and this convivation in between both in order to be able to reach our target in the future uh, 2050 with maximum uh, power uh, in, in supported by renewable and all the service. Just uh, in, inside the group we have been working in this first in the definition of this concept that now is clear, but at the beginning was not as clear as I'm talking now, because was a discussion in between. Really, it now we need to incorporate the question of the capacity, this capacity, this optimization of the rest to be able to offer these services, or he has to concentrate in the services that need to be done right now with the thermal power generation. And then finally, we decide just to incorporate both. And even uh, at the beginning, we forget or was forgetting uh, in some way other uh, technologies that um, presently are offering a flexible, uh, flexibility to the system like hydro or like other technologies that was no at the beginning inside. And then this is uh, an issue that also is reflected in the roadmap that you can see here. Uh, the original roadmap, uh, they don't care 
from my point of view, all the, these capacities that I have been talking related to the REST capacities, this REST evolution, this REST uh, uh, new services. And then at the, at the end, uh, you can see in yellow that uh, and at the very end of the preparation of the roadmap uh, was incorporated two, uh, we can say, uh, topic, that is the T22 and the D14 related to the thermal. But uh, by the contrary, was no, uh, uh, not, not enough time to incorporate these other REST capacities that you can find somewhere in between T12 REST forecast or between, for example, uh, D4, D3, but, uh, but from our point of view, it's not enough because probably we are, con uh, this is uh, probably the evolution of the roadmap was strongly conditioned for the previous how this roadmap was start starting the uh, definition. At the beginning, very few people uh, uh, from Renovable was involved in these issues because if you uh, remember the presentation of Eric, uh, excellent presentation, Eric, uh, related to the evolution from uh, until uh, this situation that we have now in the tip, uh, was uh, a situation strange because it's beginning from a smart grid, uh, the, the European initiative for networks, meaning that renewable people is not there, are not the usual place in which uh, uh, renewable people is. And in fact, I know this because uh, my uh, previous position, now I'm in renewable energy in, in Iberrola, but previously I representative uh, of uh, Iberrola in, in Brussels. And then I working with the AG, with, the, with the, uh, uh, this uh, in, in initiative, and then I know this thing. And then when I saw that, I say, my colleagues in Spain, be careful with this because this is an important issue. And then finally, I think uh, after discussion, not only because of, because of, uh, more people, we take care about that. And then this is an issue that obviously uh, yesterday Eric mentioned, and it's, uh, 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 the roadmap probably need an evolution for future, but we need to work in. Well, yes, uh, we have been working uh, finally uh, in an important issue that I think probably is the more important from my point of view, uh, that uh, the, the ATIP is confronted, this is the implementation plan. And then, uh, passing from the, this uh, long list of topics of 56 or 58 to the 38, finally, we concentrate in this 38 in order to be able to transmit all the questions related to flexibility, talking about flexibility as a general. Not just only renewable, if no renewable, uh, thermal, other uh, technologies like hydro, etc. And then, beginning, I, I pass uh, as, as, as quick as possible a, a picture aware about our work related to that uh, topics. And then the first topic that you, uh, you could find is the 14, that is improved REST demand forecasting and optimal capacity operation. This is a, an issue very important for, for the renewable, very important for the system. And then uh, finally, uh, at the beginning, there are was two different uh, uh, forecasting, one that is uh, coming from, uh, we can say, power generation, another that is related to demand. Finally, it was decided to join both in order that both of them are at the end with the same target. And then, uh, well, important issues are related to improve, to improve the rest forecast in order to be able to give this kind of services in future. As soon as you are able to know what is the, the capability, the resource to which you are able to, to have in mind, you are able to commit power for future. Meaning that it's time that happened at the beginning, we are able to forecast uh, with very few accuracy. Now the models are increasing, and then now we are concentrated more in long-term uh, uh, forecasting, meaning that no hours and no maybe days, meaning that uh, you are able to, to make a forecasting with one or two days in advance. This obviously is very good for you because then you are able to provide as much as possible what is the power that you are able to give. Because you know that in general the system, when you are uh, offering the, the, the energy to the system, you need to commit with how much energy and how long. It. Okay. Other topics as related to uh, this issue is this uh, related to the uh, integration of the storage in existing thermal generation. That is, uh, sorry, integration of existing thermal generation for increased flexibility means that uh, uh, this is a discussion that uh, as soon as uh, our power station are, has been designed with a power in mind and uh, this kind of, of uh, changing in the in our flexibilization of the power mean that you lose in some way uh, uh, efficiency 
one important issue that could uh, be incorporated to maintain the, the, the optimization technical of the power station is to incorporate some kind of, a stock, of a storage in the installation in which you could maintain the power and the energy that is not sent to the grid, you are able to store in somewhere. And later you use when you need. And this is to increase the flexibility, this kind of uh, system uh, could be in, uh, an important issue. Obviously, uh, some kind of uh, hybrid solution for combination between uh, renewable and, uh, and to reduce the risk uncertainty is important. Uh, to implement some kind of configuration in the plants to which uh, you are able to offer a better energy, a better uh, cycling, etc. An important issue, for example, is the, the use of uh, uh, CO2 for uh, yesterday, uh, I think uh, one of my colleagues was presenting here the use of, uh, of uh, synthetic gas for in operation to inject in the gas network. Uh, why not to use the same concept just for synthetic uh, gas for power generation? And uh, other important issues is just the, to, to all the concepts related to the power uh, to fuel technologies in general. Yes, not only power to gas, power to, 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 to fuel in, inside the power plant. And uh, other issues like uh, interlink fuel generation with other sector, why not, with heat or whichever. Well, you see this kind, these three uh, in general that are, uh, the only that is still open is uh, this, uh, the 20, the topic 20, because it uh, was a proposal that was uh, so interesting, but it's still in discussion how to, to manage it, that is uh, the concession in between PV and CSP. Uh, look, uh, CSP, you know, the concept of the solar power is able to, uh, this is a technology that is dispatchable, and PV no. And then the situation is that proposal is in the same place, you, you could, in, the in theory, incorporate both technologies and then to add the, we can say, the benefits of both technologies in one place in order to fulfill, to reduce the variability of the PV and increase the, we can say, less, the loss of capacity of the CSP during the night, meaning that uh, there are some kind of issues, but this is still pending to be, to be defined. Uh, there is another issue just related to uh, developing the next generation of flexible thermal plan. That's clear that uh, now, from now to 2030, there are many power stations that will be uh, finished its lifetime, meaning that a new group of power generation, of thermal power generation, probably need to be launched. In this way, uh, it's important now to have in mind all these issues that we have been discussing here, and then to incorporate a new design that incorporates all the necessities that we need from now to the future. The, the future in the future will be probably a lot of risk with some kind of uh, synchronous generation that is coming from uh, uh, probably uh, hydro and thermal that is m flexible. But this is an issue that could be in interesting to, to, to add. In the other way, another issue that is as to adapt the improvement of technology to novel power to gas, meaning that in one moment, uh, and power to liquid, meaning that other option, ad additionally to this one that I mentioned before, that is to design from zero, is that all these power station that has, for example, in Spain now, uh, we have around 85% uh, of the power station of uh, concentrated, concentrated solar, uh, sorry, um, communal cycle are almost stopped. Meaning that uh, because uh, there is no needed, I told you that this 40% of the energy is, is, uh, is renewable. And then uh, the power generation was defined uh, around 15 years ago or something like this, when that was the beginning of the launch of the wind in parallel thinking that, okay, we could offer something, but no as much as is, is offering now. And then what happened? Then this kind of installation are almost stopped or working 15%, 10%. Then this kind of installation could be adapted to offer some kind of additional services like power to gas or power to liquid in order to uh, bring the opportunity to bridge uh, uh, connection with other networks and obviously with the transport or uh, with other uh, different uh, capabilities. Uh, the topic 35 that is just related to uh, improve the flexibility of the system uh, based in, in rest. This is uh, the topic that uh, is addressing specifically the systemic concept of this that I uh, talking before. That is, what is the situation in future where uh, you have uh, mainly power electronic converter connected to the network, to the grid. 
and the synchronous system are very few. It's the same situation in future, and we control this, uh, this, the network in the same manner. Is the frequency the same uh, main uh, driver to, to managing and control the, the network? Or we have another issue, because for the converter, it's the same. A converter could work uh, 50 Earth, uh, 55, 52. It's the same for him. It's a, it's a current source, I mean, there's no problem. Even for voltage, it's the same, meaning that we need to adapt. This, this is, uh, what is the scenarios? How this will confront? Maybe even uh, there are situations in which uh, now uh, all the system is working at 50 uh, Earth and it's all together working in one moment. Could happen in future that uh, the, the, a part of the system could work separately and synchronize what is needed and uh, on to analyze these kind of issues. There is another issue that has been discussed a lot related to, uh, this is more related to uh, power electronic converter and future evolution of this power electronic converter. And we have incorporated a concept that is renewable flexible module. This is a concept that has been incorporated kind of ago by IEEE related to how you are able to incorporate technologies inside one power station together, integrated, in order to fulfill the, this uh, situation to avoid this variability of the, of the renewable, or to reduce as much as possible, and to assure the interconnection. For example, an important issue that could happen in future is the smart inverters. Distributed in resources, thousands of, uh, of systems connected in a, in a city, or whichever in a zone, in which there are inverters of very people, Customer that has one kilowatt, five kilowatt, ten kilowatt, one hundred kilowatt, all together working, connecting to the network. If this is smart enough, could be connected in between and to establish a kind of managing of this system like a virtual power station. This kind of system, how this work? Is possible this? Is not possible this? This is uh, another Im investigation that we need to, to fulfill. And then this is the, 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 the situation of the 36. Later, we address uh, the question of hydro. Sorry, hydro. Uh, because uh, hydro is, is very well known, hydro now supposes 95% of the storage in the, in the, uh, in the grid, uh, meaning in the electric grid, meaning that for future uh, this could change when the new coming from batteries, from other systems, but in any case, is uh, meaning that uh, hydro is not able to offer anything else? No. And then this is because we, co we decided to cooperate to even to increase flexibility, because even those some kind of power station, uh, hydro power station, are still uh, making flexibility, but very, in very uh, reduced speed, we can say. And not only that, it's the cost when you are incorporating a hydro, a big pump hydro uh, to the system, sometimes the flexibility, the ramp up uh, that you are able to incorporate is very costly if you increase uh, from two or three or four times per day to 30 times or to 50 times. This is possible, or this meaning that the, uh, the, the, the equipment are suffering a, a kind of, 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 uh, of uh, stress that could become that uh, you broke this installation before the time to which was designed. This is an issue that we want to, to, to analyze here. Another issue that was incorporated was uh, strongly uh, uh, analyzed was uh, environmental impact assessment on hydro projects. Uh, this is an issue that now in Europe is, is, uh, has a strong concern and is an issue that uh, is depending on the country, meaning that in one country has a rule, in other country has different rule, and then uh, depending on what are the situation of this uh, hydropower station, are confronted with different environmental concern, meaning that, uh, that we want to analyze is this concern has been really discussed in deep, if this concern related to this kind of assessment, impact assessment, environmental impact assessment are correctly done, or we can establish a minimum rule and some specification for specific places. But just, for example, uh, because it um, happened uh, in many, many situations, uh, for example, now in Spain, we are not able to use hydro during this season because it's very dry year, meaning that absolutely uh, uh, nothing meaning that the flexibility that we have from the hydro now is zero. That is because the target is just to, to drink for the water and also for, for uh, agriculture. Okay, finally, we incorporate one uh, um, 
concept of digitalization of flexible dispatchable generation technologies. We consider that this new paradigm in which we are involved related to uh, power electronic converter, new situation for this power installation, etc., need to confront with a new paradigm of control of this installation. And then this is the issue that we want to transmit here incorporate this kind of concept that has been also uh, talking or incorporated in other issues, but it's important just to uh, confront this here, talking about flexible generation. And then from my side, does, this is all, and then, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jesus. So you do bring a lot of flexibility. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good. So one quick question, and then uh, we carry on. All is clear. No, I, I see know? one ah. question over there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe you can have the microphone. <laughs> it's Reinhard Madliner from Aachen University. What you said about hydropower was interesting, but I disagree partly because uh, countries like Austria, Switzerland, and Norway have very flexible hydropower resources. And there are some innovative technologies like underground pump storage hydropower plants or ring wall storage hydro storage power plants. What's your view and position on these, on the letter two? Well, this is, uh, the comment is just, uh, just to give you an idea. Was exactly Austria who proposed this, uh, this uh, two concepts, especially this related to environment. But this is an issue that uh, the problem was we incorporate this n uh, just to, in to incorporate a discussion in between the group. Because the question was at the beginning, as I, es I explained before, this group was more related to uh, thermal flexible generation. And then at the beginning has no in mind the hydro. And then we incorporate these two issues in order to be able to discuss more deeply these issues. Because now presently in the group there are only two people from Hydro. And then uh, the situation was this. And then I agree with you that it's an issue that is open. Probably we need to discuss just related to the, to the uh, this kind, o even to incorporate other, other technologies. Because if you see, uh, we mentioned other technology, but we don't mention which one. And then we need to identify, because the question was that to incorporate technologies that could offer in the medium term some kind of solution. And then I agree with you that this maybe, mm, if you take a look inside this two topic, it's very open. And sometimes, for example, we, we avoid to incorporate a specific uh, qualificative related to variable speed or uh, underground uh, use, etc., because uh, the la the, the, this kind of, uh, we can say, um, not enough people to discuss this in, in, in proof. And this was uh, one issue. And then, in fact, uh, there is an important uh, uh, reaction from the people after the public uh, circulation of, the, of, the, uh, of this implementation plan, especially related to, to, the, to the hydro that we're trying to incorporate. But this is an issue that is still open. Huh? OK, thank you, Jesus. You're welcome. Okay, so let's move to the next presentation. Susanna has not arrived, eh, I believe. No? I mean, no. Okay, Jan Connerton. So, from Airgrid, and he's going to tell us about the DS3 project. In French, it sounds almost like a car. But it's, it's not a car. This one. Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Connington, and I work uh, for Airgrid. Um, this morning, I'm going to give you an update on the DS3 program and a sub project within that called uh, the Qualifier Trials. So, just for context, um, Airgrid is it's an all-island energy company uh, for the island of Ireland. We have three divisions. Uh, Airgrid, who operate and manage the national grid in the south. Uh, Sony, who's the system operator for Northern Ireland. And we also have SEMO, which is the uh, single energy market operation. So um, as an island, uh, we have some interconnection. Uh, we have a 500 megawatt interlink to the UK, and we have 101 based in the north. Um, 
from a European point of view and from RES, we have some very aggressive mm -hmm. um, or challenging sure. targets. We have a 40% renewable yeah. target uh, yeah. for 2020. And for us, about 37% of that is coming from uh, wind generation. Relative to some of the uh, other targets, I, I think around Europe, our ones are, are quite high compared to some of the, some of the others. And um, some of the challenges around uh, targets like that um, are system stability. And we talked about, some of the other presenters have also talked about system stability. When you have large amount of, of renewables uh, on the system and effectively you're displacing conventional plant and the services you get from those conventional plant, effectively you need to get from other sources. And predominantly, because you have high levels of res, it's going to be coming from the likes of wind and other things that are connected at that time or other storage in some cases. So we know um, we did a series of studies and uh, we believe we can uh, get to 75% res uh, by 2020. Uh, we did a lot of kind of studies, a facilitation of renewable studies, um, which identified key areas that we needed to change uh, for the system. And on the back of that, we put a program together. It's called DS3, which is the delivery of secure, sustainable system to meet that challenge, so to meet those targets. So the program itself um, is split into three main areas, um, system policies, so what policies do we need to change to increase the amount of renewables? Now, these are internal policies like control center policies, dispatch policies, also external policies, regulators, things like that. So we have a lot of influence as regards policies. Um, we could have all the policies in the world, uh, but if we don't manage to change the system tools in the control center, um, we're not going to hit those targets. And that is the second stream that we look at um, to enable us implement the changes required within the control center. And uh, lastly, the one that I'll probably speak most about today is um, system performance. And by that, really, it's about incentivizing system services. We need different types of system services when you come to a world with high res. And how do we incentivize that? How do we get new investment uh, in there? And also then, how do we performance monitor these new services and even the existing ones? Fundamentally, we don't want to be paying unless people are actually performing when we come to our system services, unless they're reacting at times they're contracted to and things. So there's a whole measurement uh, piece that needs to be put in place um, as well. Um, just maybe to give a bit of context as regards to the market and how kind of system services uh, float in with that. Traditionally, you would have had uh, a combination of energy payments capacity payments and auxiliary or ancillary services as they were known. And typically for most units and generators, the ancillary services were really um, a smaller part of their overall income. And typically they would have maybe seen it as probably their profit margin over and above their kind of cost and things. Um, but we're, we've proposed a fairly radical change to some of this where um, starting in 2016, we started to increase the pool of monies available for system services um, with a view towards incentivizing existing units or new technologies or future units to actually come and provide these services and to, I suppose, move some of the monies around in that pot. Um, and again, that's, that's something that we work very closely with the regulators in Ireland for the island um, to facilitate that. So technically, to get to 75%, um, you can operate up to 50% reasonably OK. It's a fairly green space. We're well used to doing it. You have plenty of conventional on for the other 50. And it doesn't, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't really give you too many challenges. Over that, you start to um, have issues with uh, increased variability and uncertainty. So that's a world we will be in. We will have increased uh, variability and uncertainty with wind and things. Um, we also have to have a system where we can uh, withstand higher rock off our rate of change of frequency. So we have a program which is getting the units to change their rock off settings um, because we know in a future world they have to be more flexible in that regard. And then we also need to manage the voltage and we also need to manage 
the stability of the system um, as uh, renewables increase or die off and so on. So quite, quite technically a lot of challenge when you get to 75% are in that area. We don't, we don't see 75% as a barrier. We think we can go beyond that, but it's for our initial targets are 75% for, for 2020. Um, just DS3, the program itself, um, also one of the goals is obviously 75% by 2020, but it's also that we have wind curtailment less than 5% for 2020 as well. Um, and some of the at issues at the moment, um, say when you're at 50% SNSP, it means that we curtail wind quite a lot. Um, that's not good for the wind industry, the wind farms don't like it, effectively they're they're, uh, they're not losing money because they're curtailed. And that has to do with um, some of our set rules and policies that currently exist. And when we, when we get to a 75% SNSP or renewables, then really the whole program is designed to push that barrier down to make sure that our, our wind curtailment is down less than 5%. So to use as much as we can of what's there. Um, so the overall benefit from a DS3 Point of view, I think this kind of sums it up uh, fairly well. Um, ultimately, the program itself is designed to facilitate increased levels. It's we say wind there, but actually it's, it's renewables as well. We have solar coming on and things as well. The impact of that is that you would displace traditional generation or fossil-based generation because you have more renewables on, you have less conventional. Other, the knock-on is wholesale energy prices, uh, wind prices and things will drive prices down. And ultimately as well, you're also achieving your emissions targets and lower, at a lower cost. So that's what, they, that's what the program is designed to do. Um, and that's the goal, I suppose, from the, from the team who work within the program. Um, I think we have a very good understanding of what we're trying to get to, what the goals are and things. It's very clear where we fit in, I think, from a consumer benefit point of view um, and what the ultimate uh, impact would be. So what are we doing at the moment? Well, we are managing um, between 50, 55% and SNSP at this moment in time. Um, and that happens quite, quite regularly, depending on the amount of wind. Um, and we are also trialing 60% on a trial basis by the end of the year. And hopefully in Q1, we'll be having an operating policy that we will operate at 60% from a going forward by uh, probably Q1, we would have said next year. So this is, from a control center point of view, they manage this, and this is their operating policy at this moment in time. So some of the critical next steps for the wind integration piece, um, we need to complete that transition to a higher rock offsettings. It, it is a critical thing. Uh, the facilitation of increased uh, levels of exports. So like I said earlier, we have interconnection and things, and ultimately maximizing the interconnector to, to export at times when we have high wind. Um, we have a whole series of targets around the inertia floor and lowering that. Um, and we also have some policy and stability things when we come to um, reducing our minimum set rules and things. So underpinning all that really is operational changes within the control center, um, and also the remuneration of the actual increased system services that we need uh, at 75% and above, or even getting to 75%. Um, so it's, it's complicated stuff. Um, we do a lot of workshops. There's a lot of kind of thinking going on. But I suppose we are seeing critical deliveries within the control center and things, and we are starting to get up to those, those high levels of actually operation, but um, it's, it's a challenge. So just system services then, um, which I said, is, a, uh, is one of those um, blocks within the wider DS3 program. So um, in 2016, or pre-October 2016, we had HAS, or harmonized services arrangements, um, that was seven services contracted bilateral contracts, individual units and so on for services, predominantly terminal plant. And in October uh, 2016, we went to what we call an interim arrangement 
where we expanded the number of services into 11 based on studies and some of the papers we'd produced and the renewable energy ones and a lot of modeling and so on to come up with additional services that we would need. And we contracted those in a full kind of open procurement kind of process as opposed to previous bilaterals. So we, we see ourselves as a TSO being technology agnostic. Uh, we don't, um, other than its renewables, we don't call out specific technologies within that and so on. So uh, it's a very open thing. Again, at that stage, we had predominantly terminal plant with a small amount of, of new technology in there. And next year, um, in April 2018 and in, sim in September 2018, we're going out for an additional three, uh, which are fast uh, frequency response products uh, in another open procurement round and more than likely for longer term contracts, somewhere between four and eight years, depending. And also with those arrangements, we are trying to put in place um, a set of procurement for future based um, technologies, so we'll give people maybe a couple of years to build their plant and have it in place, but we would award them with the contract now and things. So, all about trying to encourage um, getting services from, from new tech and things. So, we see that been the first shift in, in system services coming from, from other alternatives. Um, and every six months after that, we will uh, facilitate any new players are people who want to change their characteristics of their plant. Um, it is incentivized, those arrangements will incentivize based on uh, people getting extra payments at times of um, high SNSP. So if you're on the bars and we're up at 60 or 65% and you're able to provide very fast frequency response and things, then we pay you more than if you're available to do that at 40% or 50%. So at times of scarcity, we pay more for those. Um, so the, the services themselves, I won't go into, into them all. They're basically uh, around system security. They go from uh, milliseconds out to, out to hours. They are building on the existing seven services that we had previously. And they're, they're around stuff like inertia response or fast frequency response. And they're also about um, catering for forecast errors and ramping. Um, so I'll just move on to the qualification trials piece. So when we did our major procurement last year, there were certain technologies and things that would not qualify. So it didn't make it through the, through the, the procurement process. And at the time, we, we knew, I suppose, coming into that procurement that certain technologies uh, wouldn't, wouldn't maybe get through or, or things, because at the end of the day, it's a TSO we have a responsibility not to um, engage services at scale that aren't proven and that we can't measure. So there was a, there was a series of, of things that we knew we wouldn't get, but yet we know we need in the future. So we set up a qualification trial process to validate and prove some of these technologies. Um, and uh, so what did, it, what did it look like and how did it fit in? Well, you have system services itself as a procurement if you are an existing provider um, and you uh, could provide the service already, then you got straight in and effectively you got a contract. And that could be for primary operating reserve or stuff like that. So it's, we would have been using you for years and we know you can do it. If you're a new technology or a new service providers or a different type, um, we wouldn't have had a, we wouldn't have known what your capability was and it certainly wouldn't have been proven from a system operator point of view. Um, and in that case, then we have to develop a series of standards and compliance before we would let it onto a system at scale. So that's where the qualification trials comes into place to ultimately bring people through a process, certify a technology, um, not, not individual uh, units for services, but to certify an actual technology class and there forward for our next procurement and procurements after that, that that technology would be able to to enter into, the, into those uh, procurement rounds. So it's, it's large scale deployment of new services from uh, existing players or, or even existing plant that might change some of their characteristics, we're happy to take it as well. Um, 
and also new tech. But ultimately, we need to develop an understanding of the capability. And what we mean by that is, well, what are the operating standards in that? What, what is the policy? If we were to put these things on the system, how do we operate them? Um, how do we manage them? What is the performance metrics? Um, what kind of recording equipment do we need to use? What are we expecting them to do? Different technologies have different capabilities as regards what they can and can't do and uh, the reactions. And then everything from metering control center tools, how do we, how do we schedule some of this stuff? How do we, what, what tools do we need within the control center to, to deploy these things at, at large scale? So the trials were split into, into two aspects. Really, we are looking at proven ability. So um, can we prove that certain technologies can provide certain services? And also then, for other services, can we do a measurability piece? So how do we measure it? So we had a procurement exercise. We looked at wind, DSM, other tech for a particular kind of services. And we also had measurability. Um, and it was a fairly broad um, approach as regards who could, who could come in effectively. It was a bidding process. You will see our maximum values are quite low. So we're trialing these things at low uh, scale, taking the learnings, publishing the learnings, and then changing our operating policy and our procurement to allow it to come in at large scale. Um, and we got, I suppose, from the procurement point, most of what we were looking for. We didn't get kind of ramping services from wind and other tech, but we got them where we'd be certifying them or trialing them for primary operating reserve um, and things. And the fast frequency one, we got a good kind of spread as regards um, providers coming into the procurement process. Timelines, uh, we did a consultation. As with nearly everything we have to do these days, we, we have to do public consultations. Um, so we did a consultation. We had a, a procurement run from November 16 to February 16, quite short. And uh, the trial started in March 15 and have just finished at the end of August uh, 17, sorry. Um, and we are now currently in the process of writing up the outcomes. And we're going to be, in the next two and a half weeks, we have to publish a paper, which is the qualification trials output. What have we learned? What are we certifying? What are we saying is OK? What's, what is the next things we want to look at? Um, so just on the concept of the trials themselves, so I said it earlier, but ultimately, we are approving a technology class as opposed to an individual. Um, the trials, we ran an open procurement, um, and service providers were paid to take part. So as a way of incentivizing them to, to come forward, some of them that payment was zero, they were happy to do it on a, on a pro bono basis and other ones we paid for. We run them at small scale with maximum caps of volume. Um, and ultimately, successful completion means they're on a proven technology list going forward. Um, so it's not, I suppose, proven technologies to do this stuff and allowing them to come into procurement in an open process is not without its risks as well as regards the amount of services you could get. Um, over and above what you might need and things. So we, we have to keep an eye on that. Um, some of the key learnings um, from the trials just gone, like I said, we can't do too many of regards what we're certifying and not because we haven't published the outcome of the trials yet, but we'd gladly make that. It's, it's a public document when we do send it. Um, what we would have noticed is we need a lot more coordination uh, with the DSOs and the DNOs. <laughs> The services we're looking for are coming from uh, distribution connected as opposed to directly TSO connect. So there was quite a bit of engagement with the, with the um, DSOs to allow them, in certain cases, to allow wind farms and things to provide s services for trials in particular areas that they may have restriction sets on that particular line and things. So a lot of engagement to free up different parts of the system to allow us to trial different things in different locations. Um, we need probably a better mechanism for new technologies. At the, one of our things coming forward was when we did it the first time around, we said you had to be connected. Uh, if, you weren't, if you weren't on the grid and we couldn't monitor you, then how were we going to kind of prove it? So that was probably a limitation for 
say, other new technologies who wouldn't have had a grid connection and may have been more embryonic things, but oh, effectively we didn't allow them into the trial at that stage. The running at the procurement um, took a significant amount of time. Uh, because it was competitive, because we had to do all due notices, it was just, I think we will do something a lot slicker, maybe shorter the next time around. Um, and our timelines, when we look at it now, we think, well, actually, we, we had a very short timeline between ending the procurement, getting contract signs, and the trial starting. And just with uh, difficulties around getting contract signs and commercial arrangements and things, it, it delayed us a bit. The other one is that in an ideal world, we would have signals installed from the command center and things onto those particular um, units involved, and we would have device recorders in place. Now, for the trials, um, we got people to send the, the outcomes after recordings when we had events. Like, you, because it's live on the system, you're dependent on events to prove some of this stuff, as opposed to studies or simulations or whatever. And um, if you don't have events, then you, you run short of actually being able to certify a technology. Um, timing, we would probably align it better. Uh, like I said, we're, we're finishing October. We have, a new we have a new procurement process starting in November. Uh, those contracts come into place next April and things, which is, is fine from a procurement of services, but it doesn't really tie in necessarily well to the trials timelines because ultimately trialing wind over summer isn't particularly as helpful as trialing wind over winter. So we need to look at what future kind of trials, the timing of them and what they, what they would look like. And I think going forward, we will probably target specifically, specific maybe technologies and things from a, from a trials perspective. We will probably do more with storage and so on um, going forward. Uh, that was it. I will take any questions. It is a fairly broad kind of thing, but I'll take any questions people have on it. Thanks. Yep. One quick question. It was very interesting. So I have many questions, yep. but I uh, keep them for the round table. <laughs> okay. One question from the uh, the audience. The gentleman over there at the back. Sleeve storage. With the blue shirt. You want to bring a new service, so the, fi the 15th <laughs> new service. My question goes in the sense, uh, how big will be megawatt scale of storage? Uh, have you considered this already? So um, we, don't, we don't have a figure on storage. Um, we, we know that, um, I suppose, from the next procurement and things, that we've had a lot of engagement with potential battery operators who would like to connect onto the system and things. There is a connection process involved to have to get an actual connection and things. So that part of it would, would take time, but we don't, we don't put a figure on it. We look more at what is the overall system requirements and we don't decide how that's to be split up by technology. So we don't, I don't have a figure for that. Thank you, Jan. So let's, Thank let's you. discuss you in the round table. So let's move to the two next presentations. So it is Susanna Apinazis from Technalia. So the first one is about the MMC project, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Please go ahead, Susanna. I don't know if it works. It works, yes. Okay. So my name is Susana Piñaniz uh, and I work in Tecnalia, which is a technological center in the Basque Country in the north of Spain. Okay, I will going to present uh, two of our project. And the first one is the MMC, which is the modular multilevel converter. These are the points uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, so first, uh, general information about the project, and then uh, some details about the power modules, the control systems, and the status and next steps, uh, and the barriers to innovation deployment. 
So um, the general objective is to develop a scale MMC-based test rig to provide a facility to, uh, for research uh, or and development of control algorithms for VSC HVDC. Uh, and we are working on multi-terminals and mesh grids. Uh, this is a direct project uh, provided from Technalia to the University of New South Wales in Australia in 2015. Why MMC for HVDC technology? Um, the real VSC converters uh, at the HVDC substations uh, has a uh, high, high power, uh, around one gigawatt, and uh, high voltage, 320 uh, kilowatt around, more or less. Mm, but actually, uh, the, the state of the art of the semiconductors uh, has uh, some constraints uh, in relation to uh, maximum current, uh, which is around three kiloampere. And, and also about the, the maximum voltage. So to reach such uh, power, um, we need uh, or, or different semiconductors or to, to do something with the topology. And the idea of this MMC topology is to uh, split the uh, different voltages in order to, to use this actual semiconductor, but uh, in a way it's possible to reach uh, such uh, power. So, and, and also this uh, topology is very flexible. In fact, uh, uh, the solution of, of the main manufacturers uh, of these uh, kind of converters are based on this topology. So this is uh, an architecture or the diagram of, of this MMC converter. Each box is uh, what we call submodule, and everything is split, uh, the power, the voltage in each submodule. Um, this is a three-phase uh, converter, and each phase uh, is composed by uh, two, two arms and the arms uh, can have a different number of submodules. In our case, um, the, the project uh, has 96 power submodules, but, and, and it, it is uh, very flexible, very configurable, as we can work as just one MMC converter um, with these uh, 96 power submodules and with 16 submodules per arm. We can work also uh, with uh, two uh, independent converters using 48 submodules with eight submodules per arm. And in this case, uh, we have uh, a point to point uh, scheme. And also, uh, we have, uh, we can work uh, with this uh, equipment as uh, four independent converters with 24 submodules, uh, with four submodules per arm in order to, to work with multi-terminal and mesh uh, links. The nominal power uh, is 40 kilowatt and a DC voltage uh, is uh, 1,600 volts. And it, it is controlled uh, by a D, DSPs. This is a picture of, of uh, what we develop. Uh, we can see uh, on the left hand uh, one cabinet with uh, 48 submodules. Each slot is a submodule, and well, uh, there are two converters uh, similar. And in the other part, we can see uh, the, the rest of the board, the uh, CPU, the DSP, some inductances, and so on. This is a picture of the submodule. Each submodule uh, is a little power uh, supply. Uh, it, it has four MOSFETs. 
per sub module, and it's also flexible uh, uh, because uh, this project is to, to, to do research. So um, in this uh, case, we can work as a half bridge or a full bridge configuration, and also it's uh, configurable, the DC bus, to emulate different capacitances. The control system, uh, we wanted to develop an architecture able to control uh, hundreds of submodules, much more than uh, what we, this project um, has, as, as in a real MMC converter. So uh, everything has to be uh, synchron synchronous, and, and the main advantages of this control is that uh, it has high reliability, uh, it reduces uh, the wiring to, to uh, improve the, the installation and the maintenance, and it's uh, very scalable uh, with the potential of using different number of, of submodules in each uh, converter. So this is uh, block diagrams. Uh, what we see in the picture is the uh, on the right um, cabinet, the MMC electrical cabinet, we can see this is uh, composed by all the submodules, but also the optical splitter. And on the left hand, uh, we can see uh, different, well, the, the D space and uh, different boards, the contactors, precharge, uh, the CPU, and different measurement boards. Uh, I'm going to explain the characteristics of the control system. Uh, this is a distributed uh, control. Each module uh, has an FPGA to generate uh, the, the, si the signals for the, the MOSFETs, and, and it also manages the communication. Uh, there's also a, a fiber uh, to, to connect uh, each submodule with the optical hub and from the optical hub to the CCU and another uh, fiber to have a redundancy for the system. Uh, this is the technology. It's called PON, Passive Optical Networks. Uh, it's extensive, extensively used in, in the um, access networks, so we have applied a telecommunication uh, technology for this industrial application. Uh, because of the benefits I have mentioned it. And it is a point to multipoint uh, optical endpoint network. It's passive and uh, we can reach um, with a single fever up to 128 uh, endpoints and with a quite high uh, speed. These are pictures of, uh, of uh, the, some boards of the converters, uh, the sub modules, and, and another measurement board uh, that uh, need a pluggable board, which is uh, on the right um, up uh, left, um, and uh, to, to implement this communication. And on the, on the left uh, side, uh, we can see the CPU. All the boards and all the system uh, has been developed in Technalia. So the idea is the CCU received uh, different measurements, the DC voltage of each uh, submodule, the arm currents, DC and AC voltage of the whole converter, and the alarms. Uh, through the communication uh, network. Uh, and then uh, the CCU executes the modulation strategy and the high-level control algorithms. This board uh, prepares uh, the information in duty cycles to send uh, back to the submodules and, and, and then in the uh, submodules, as I've mentioned, uh, is where uh, the signals uh, attack the MOSFETs. And the high level um, control, uh, it is possible to, to be implemented in the D space or, or in general in a real uh, time fast prototype on hardware. 
or, or inside the, the CCU itself. If we use this uh, hardware in the loop, it's uh, fast uh, to, to use the MATLAB Simulink or, or prototyping or testing uh, these uh, boards. It's quite, quite useful. And uh, so this project was uh, uh, successfully commissioned in Australia and researchers of uh, that university are using it. Uh, and uh, what we uh, can do, we are in collaboration with them uh, now, from now, is uh, develop the control algorithms for mesh HVDC grid um, research on novel circulating current controllers, uh, improving uh, grid bal and balances, also the benchmarking of different circulating current controllers, and apart from these algorithms, uh, we can experiment uh, the assessment of harmonic stability studies, and um, uh, Apart from this HVDC area, it is possible to use this topology uh, using the Cascade H-Bridge converter uh, for, uh, for example, uh, medium voltage statcoms or large uh, PV application. And it's also thought in our steps for the future. Um, Talking about the barriers and innovation deployment, uh, well, uh, the a barrier is uh, this topology is a very complex system uh, to, to be controlled. Uh, is quite expensive. Uh, well, this little uh, scale um, project, not so, not so much, but I mean, increasing the, the power uh, is, uh, extremely expensive for, uh, for, for a center like us, so it's, it's difficult to increase uh, the power uh, in demonstrator, and uh, we need uh, the support of, of the manufacturers, but, uh, well, it's, uh, there are few, and, and they want to protect their technology, uh, so it's not uh, an easy stuff as well. And uh, also, uh, the legal framework is not so developed, but uh, now uh, yeah, there, there are some groups working on it. And that's it for the first project. So, any question? So one quick question to... Uh you have a question? Yes. It's a very interesting presentation. You, at the very end, you say uh, there is missing legal framework. What would you like to be regulated there? Can you just? <laughs> it is not really clear to me. No, I mean, uh, I, I can't uh, say a specific uh, task, but uh, there are now many people working on it as, as the, the regulations are not clear for this uh, HVDC multi-terminal and meshed, yeah, at this point. Okay. Okay, okay thanks, Shana. So let's move to the okay. second presentation. So the, the HVDC, the HVDC, sorry, link after the uh, yeah, converter. Yeah, everything around HVDC. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So this is uh, our second project. This is uh, related to HVDC as well. Um, and uh, the, the exact name is uh, Links for Marine Energy Evacuation and Future Solutions. These are the points I'm going to talk about. Uh, apart from the general info, uh, information, uh, this is uh, composed by uh, different uh, research lines, and I will go into some details of uh, everyone. And at and, and the, uh, the end, again, uh, explaining some barriers uh, to innovation deployment. So this project uh, is uh, 
I thought to, to make progress in, in different research links uh, for high voltage direct current transmission uh, with the idea uh, that the bus companies uh, in the field of energy uh, are able to be in a good position in the new scenario of the massive deployment of the offshore wind farms. Uh, this project has been developed uh, by a consortium led by Technalia, but and the rest of the partners uh, are the GCL group from the University of Basque Country, Ormazabal and Arteche. We started uh, in 2015 and the project is about to finish by the end of this year. And, and the total uh, finance uh, is uh, 1.3 million euros and all uh, has been financed by the Basque government. And so the research lines um, are, uh, first of all, a hybrid HVDC transmission architecture, uh, an HVDC lab to validate uh, what we research in the first point, a high level control of VSC HVDC converter station for grid support and uh, current and voltage measurement in HVDC system and circuit breakers based on superconducting materials. So let's start with the first one, the hybrid HVDC transmission architecture. The objective of this architecture is to develop a new HVDC hybrid system uh, optimized for the transmission of energy generated in the offshore generation plants. Um, this architecture is composed by a diode rectifier and an optional statcom in the offshore substation and an VSC MMC converter in the onshore substation. Uh, this is the, the, the block diagram. The advantages of this uh, solution with respect to, to the uh, VSC MMC converter is that uh, it has less complexity, uh, lower size and weight, high efficiency and reliability, and lower cost. But on the other hand, um, it has lower flexibility and uh, uh, we have to, to control the AC collector voltage. And uh, depending on if we use or not the STATCO, as I said, is optional, but um, uh, if uh, it's possible uh, to, to have to control uh, from the wind turbines uh, instead of of, of the substation converter, and it is a radical change. So we, we work in different tasks. The first task um, is this. Uh, we did an analysis of feasibility and dimensioning of the elements. Uh, these are some figures. Um, just to mention that the power of STATCOM is uh, five times less that the power of the link. A second task um, was uh, the development of algorithms uh, to control the AC collector voltage. As I mentioned, uh, could be, uh, if, if we use an STATCOM, uh, it is a centralized solution, but if not, uh, must be distributed. And then uh, we have to, to do the voltage control in the wind turbines converters. And the third task uh, is the development of the control algorithms of the VSC MMC located in the onshore substations. Uh, these are some uh, characteristics. Uh, the, the, uh, another task uh, has been the development of the model uh, with the proposed transmission architecture, the, the whole model or with all the elements and the validation for normal and disturbed operation conditions, the validation of the algorithms. Um, what we have to do now is uh, to, to, 
I'm going to talk afterwards that uh, I w uh, we, we are preparing uh, a lab, so we have to validate all these uh, studies, validate it actually at a simulation level, but uh, in uh, hardware. So we have to integrate it and then uh, do the validation. And uh, in the medium term, uh, as mentioned before, uh, we need uh, uh, the interest of a manufacturer to, to, to scale up the, the demonstrator. So this is the second, the second uh, research line. This is the lab. Uh, we want to, to own an HVDC lab with this hybrid architecture. These are uh, the, the diagram. Uh, we have um, two, um, two of source of station with the diode rectifier and a statcom and uh, an onshore uh, sewer station. Uh, we are going to, to do this lab in two phases. The first uh, one, uh, we are going to construct uh, just one, um, one uh, offshore substation and, and the emulator of the wind turbine. And in the second phase, uh, we will uh, close all the lab with the onshore substation and the second uh, wind farm. Uh, we, we are uh, going to finish this development by the end of this year. Another research line is the high-level control for VSC HVDC converter station uh, for grid support. Here, uh, the objective is to analyze the interaction between the VSC HVDC converter and the AC system uh, to study different phenomena uh, related uh, to power quality and uh, to voltage and frequency control. Um, different task to, to reach this objective is uh, the first one is to analyze the influence of VSC HVDC converter on the AC grid power quality. Uh, these are some conclusions uh, uh, about this uh, study. Uh, one is that the voltage harmonics on the AC side um, of the VSC converter depends on the design and configuration. The current harmonics depend not only on the voltage harmonic but on the uh, impedance uh, frequency characteristics and the, uh, at the connection point and also the harmonic impedance of the substation. Um, Another conclusion is that multi-level VSC converter uh, has lower harmonic voltage distortion than two-level converters, but uh, uh, on the other hand, the resonant phenomenon of harmonic amplification may appear. And also the reduction in the emission of uh, the usual harmonics uh, is linked to the increase in the emission of the supraharmonics. Another task is the study of the influence of uh, these uh, converters on the system operation. Uh, they, uh, then uh, we have been working uh, in the analysis of um, grid codes, different grid codes, and the implementation of control algorithms to comply with uh, these uh, grid codes. And, and also uh, for the, uh, these uh, control algorithms for the enhancement of interaction ACDC uh, with this, uh, all these uh, phenomena. We have be, been working also in the development of AC grid models. We have uh, selected the secret test grid as this uh, is a mixed uh, grid. And, and uh, we have been working on, on this uh, phenomenon, the voltage and frequency variation and balance uh, voltages uh, for right through, subsynchronous oscillation, and harmonics distortion. So now um, we have finished uh, this analysis of grid codes and the implementation and validation of, of the models of the AC grid. And part of the control algorithms has been, uh, have been validated, uh, the ones to comply with the grid codes, uh, and uh, the 
control of active and reactive power, the voltage frequency and balance and unbalance voltage dips. What we have to do by the end of this year is to, to close this validation uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the validation of the control algorithms uh, for the power oscillation damping and the subsynchronous uh, oscillation and to do an analysis of harmonics of wind farms connected to the AC grid through these HVDC substations. Um, another research line is the current and voltage measurement in this HVDC system. Uh, the objective here is to design two sensors, uh, one uh, for the current and, and another one for the voltage, uh, specific for these uh, HVDC lines. And as they are oriented to direct current, uh, they do not exploit a principle of electromagnetic induction, induction which is uh, more for conventional transformers. Uh, and uh, the solution for voltage measurement has been RC, an RC divider. This is similar to high voltage capacitive voltage transformer and it will replace the medium voltage inductive electromagnetic unit by an electronic one. And for the current measurement, uh, uh, this is an optical solution. Uh, this is a diagram of this solution. It is composed by the current sensor itself, an insulator, and a terminal electronic unit, uh, also called concentrator. Uh, the operating principle is based on the magneto-optical Faraday effect and, and the concentrator uh, includes this optical part, a laser light source, and also a digital output interference, uh, compatible with the uh, typical standards. Uh, both se sensors have been uh, validated at uh, the uh, lab, but uh, additional uh, test has to be done. And uh, to finish, uh, we have been uh, analyzing these uh, solutions, circuit breakers uh, based on superconducting materials. The idea is uh, to, to, to see the feasibility of using this kind of switches um, combined with the conventional ones for the DC current cutoff in HVDC. Now, uh, the extinction of DC faults uh, are focused on the AC circuit breakers, but it's not possible uh, to, to, to have this solution for the, for the future, for the multi-terminal grids. Uh, so uh, the superconducting uh, could be a solution. So uh, the task we have uh, developed uh, are the followings. First of all, uh, we did an analysis of the DC circuit breaker technology and also about the, the high temperature superconduction materials. Um, we analyzed as well uh, the, the superconducting fault limiting devices uh, with uh, looking uh, to the requirements of HVDC which could be uh, this minimum impedance uh, under normal operation, this quick uh, limit of, of a current and automatic recover and fail safe, and, and it has to be compact and lightweight stru structure. Uh, so um, in principle, uh, SVCL could be attractive candidates, but uh, they have some problems as well. Uh, one is the, well, a, a ripple in the DC, and uh, the other is around, well, the complexity of superconductivity and the cost. Uh, we need two, um, two um, devices in each termination point, and, and uh, the cryogenic, cryogenic system, which is quite uh, complex and expensive, and also the, the, the materials. Um, 
we look uh, into applications in HVDC and, and uh, actually there's no evidence of project apart from studies, theoretical studies and simulation in HVDC. So the only project uh, uh, using superconductivity for this um, uh, objective is in AC. Uh, Anyway, uh, we have been uh, thinking of, of uh, concept of, of uh, this FCL for DC, and we are working now on simulations. And this is, uh, this is not finished yet. And again, uh, the barriers uh, to innovation, uh, I see more or less the same as I mentioned before, uh, with the, with the one uh, related to this hybrid architecture, uh, if, if uh, we don't use the STATCOM, and, and in this case, if the control is completely different, uh, it's difficult to, to go ahead. It's not impossible, but it's a barrier itself. And that's it. Oh, another question. I know again. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, I have a question on this uh, challenging manufacturer topic, huh? <laughs> which uh, seems to be a challenge here. Does that mean the big manufacturers have solved all the problems, but we cannot give them <laughs> new additional solutions and we want to catch up? What is ongoing here? Can you give a few insights into this difficult challenge, please? I'm not sure, as it's so secret, but <laughs> uh, I think uh, they have uh, advantage. Uh, they have been working for a long time, but uh, I don't think everything is solved. So it's uh, things to do for them, for uh, the research uh, community, but it's sure that uh, they, they, they have some, a lot of advantages. Yes. Yeah, so you think that progress needs, uh, in order to have progress, we need to open more huh, and involve more parties, mm. I guess. Uh, I, don't know, so I, I don't know, I understand their position. Uh, of course, uh, but this is a barrier in a way too, because uh, if much more uh, brains is uh, working on it, uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. So if I got it right, Remy is sitting at the back. We have a 20 minute break now. It is just outside or is it same location as yesterday? Same location as yesterday. So for those of you who know, so please uh, uh, show the other ones. So it's uh, across the street. So it's 20 minutes sharp. So it means that uh, uh, yeah, five minutes to go, five minutes to come back. So uh, try to be quick so that we start again on time at 11.20. Thanks. Yeah, you can. Go to the yeah, you can keep it. No, you can keep it.